What's going on, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Pac-12 Takeover Podcast. I'm your host, Max Torres. We are rocking and rolling uh, with the Pac-12 Takeover Pod. This is our third episode um, as we kind of try to get into a little bit more of a regular cadence. Uh, recently covered uh, USC and Washington State and dove into their previews and kind of some schedule predictions. But now we're rolling right along in the Pac-12 Conference, also known as the Conference of Champions. And today we have a very interesting team and one that I am super excited to talk about, and that is the Utah Utes. And joining me to break down the Utah Utes is Spencer McLaughlin. He is my good friend and the host of two awesome podcasts, the Locked on Ducks podcast and Locked on Pac-12. How are we doing, man? We are doing fantastic and rocking and ready to roll to talk some Utes. Absolutely. Well, um, yeah, I've, I've come on your show a bunch, so it's it's nice to, to have you on my, one of my shows. I also host the Ducks Dish podcast covering the Oregon Ducks um, and like to talk a lot of football and recruiting there. And last year, I'm not going to go as far as saying it was a changing of the guard because I don't think it necessarily was. But Utah, you got, you know, if you follow the Pac-12 and the Utes for a while, you know, or if you just follow football last year, they won the Pac-12 for the first time since joining the conference, uh, which was definitely big for them. Finished with a 10-4 and overall record. So kind of what our plan is for this episode of the Pac-12 Takeover podcast is to start it with some big picture talking points and questions coming off of last season. Going to talk about some key additions and then also returners for the squad in 2022 and then some, some notable losses. Uh, because that was a, a really strong team. And then make sure you stick around for the end of the episode where Spencer and I are going to give our game-by-game -game predictions for the Utes in 2022. So I think a good place to start, uh, Spencer, is this question I have is, how do you think Utah is is viewed in the Pac-12 now, seeing that they were able to get their, their first conference title since joining the Pac-12? I think they're the team to beat. I, I don't know how you can look at it any other way. And I understand that, you know, some people might jump to USC and say that, oh, well, the Trojans have added a bunch of people in the transfer portal and they've got Lincoln Riley. And I understand that. And USC is going to be a good team and they're going to be significantly better than they were in, in 2021 when they went four and eight. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, that's just not something that, that's going to happen. And they've added a bunch of talent, but even though they, they've done an incredible job in the transfer portal, the first or second best transfer class in the country, it still takes more than one year to, to, to rebuild a program like that. I mean, this is still a USC team that even though they've added some players on the defensive side of the ball, a corner from Colorado, a linebacker from Bama, and they're hoping Corey Foreman can pop a little bit. They're still missing pieces. They're still missing that, that, that cohesion that you need particularly as a defensive unit, and they're missing depth as well for a defense that allowed 62 points at home to UCLA in a loss and allowed, I believe it was 45 to Oregon State at home in a loss. So those sorts of issues can't be fixed in one year. They can be improved upon, but to get to a championship level, I think it takes at least two years maybe three, but now I think the portal probably makes it easier to do that in two. But uh, coming back to the Utes, I mean, I don't know how even with the the small handful of losses they've had from last year's team, certainly some talented departures, notably Devin Lloyd, a first round draft pick among them. I don't know how you can look at them and think of them in any other way than, than seeing them as the favorites in the Pac-12. And, you know, a changing of the guard might be going a, a little bit too far because you have Lincoln Riley coming in. And I, I think it's more of a, a legitimized realization of their ascension within the Pac-12 conference and other really big, complicated words. So I, I think that, you know, Utah has just uh, established themselves and they've legitimized themselves not as the team anymore that can't quite get over the hump, but the team that got over the hump emphatically smacking Oregon around twice in three weeks after the Ducks were uh, certainly the, the, pre the probably favorites going in, being the two-time reigning Pac-12, one-and-a-half-time reigning Pac-12 champions. But I, I think they've firmly put themselves in that conversation year in and year out. They've earned that, and Kyle Whittingham has 
as impressive of a reputation and resume as you're going to find in college football anywhere in the country. And uh, I think the amount of national respect that they're getting from from people outside the Pac-12 is starting to grow as well. And even though they didn't win that Rose Bowl, I think that game did a lot for them in that respect as well. And I, I think it's nothing but but upward trends right now for the Utes. And uh, they're certainly a team that they're my pick right now to win the Pac-12 until you know, USC or Oregon can, can show me otherwise. But going into the year, Utah is the only team I'd feel confident in picking because I, I think the other two schools I just mentioned, I've got too many question marks compared to the Utes. I think a good way to view last year's season for the Utes and their Pac-12 title win is not so much like a changing of the guard, but more so almost like an arrival is kind of how it feels for me because – you know, call it, you know, look back, you know, four or five years, a handful of years. As long as Kyle Whittingham has been there, I feel like Utah has always been one of those teams that you can just never count out. You you don't want to face them in like, you know, a crucial week or like late in the season, like in November. They're never or bad. They're exactly. never bad. They're, they're always going to give you a good fight. They've always had really, really good play in the trenches, particularly on the defensive line, which I'm sure we're going to talk about this episode. But yeah, ten and four last year um, with with losses to BYU, San Diego State. Those were early in the year. San Diego State was triple overtime, mind you. Uh, Oregon State, and then um, they lost to Ohio State in one of the you know best Rose Bowls in in, in recent memory. And Great and I think if you can, if you can, I'm not calling a loss a good thing, but just the showing that they had in that game, I think, really speaks volumes to how much progress that this program has made and. And just, I feel like I'm really excited to see where where they go from from here, looking into 2022. Even though they have some losses, but I think that they have to be viewed, I would say, as the top dog in the in the Pac-12. And you know, I think one of the reasons I was so excited for this podcast, uh, because like I was saying, this is only my third episode, is because it's going to help me expand my coverage and talk about the conference as a whole. Um, you know, I, I was pretty forthright saying that I cover the ducks, but I don't want to come off as a Homer. I mean, I mean, I cover the ducks and I feel like since I've started covering them, it's made me look at them a lot, you know, more critically and call them out for their faults and then what have you. So I feel like I'm right there with you with, with Utah being viewed as the top dog in the conference and as the team to beat, you have Kyle Whittingham coming back. Obviously he's really, really established as a really strong head coach. And you have Cam Rising coming back, but we talked about how view how we should view Utah. Or we think Utah should be viewed within the Pac-12. Now let's take it a step further. Let's talk about where how we think Utah is viewed nationally. Because you you dial it back a couple years into 2019, they were looking like as long as they were going to be Oregon that they could make that push to the playoff for the first time for them, uh, and they would be only the third Pac-12 team to have done that at the time. Obviously, the wheels kind of fell off, and, and Oregon uh, really took it to them that year. But now heading into 2022, you got a Pac-12 championship to your name, and you got a marquee game in Florida to start things off. Yeah, I think nationally, the the respect they're getting is is growing. I, I don't think it's you know going any direction except up. Uh, and the next step for them. Yeah, winning a New Year's Six Bowl would certainly be a next step, but I think it's getting into the college football playoff because when they were 11 and one going into that Pac-12 championship game, when they were favored against Oregon, and you know they end up losing that game in Santa Clara and uh, coming up short, and then you know falling in the Alamo Bowl. And fun stat, by the way, I believe the last five or six losers of the Pac-12 championship game have lost the Alamo Bowl. I don't know. I don't remember the last Pac-12 team to win the Alamo Bowl. I think it was Washington State, actually. That was the last time the Ducks won won that bowl game. Just for all you betters out there, that seems to be a pretty, uh, a, a pretty safe bet a, as of late. But I, I think people still have at least a, a small perception of like, well, Utah hasn't quite made it yet. Like, yeah, they've been close. They, they've almost gotten there, but they haven't quite gotten in. I'd liken them a little bit to a Baylor. Right. A team that you look at uh, from a national perspective and you know, OK, that's a team that's going to contend for a conference championship. And and we know that and, and understand that. But are they going to get into the playoff? Ah, I kind of feel like they're going to be more uh, of a New Year's six team. And uh, I think if Utah can keep themselves in the playoff discussion throughout the course of the season, which they have the opportunity to do right off the bat with Florida, which we'll talk about here in 
in just a moment, I'm sure. I think that that's going to do even more to to give them the the respect that, you know, in one sense they deserve, but in another sense they, they have to continue to earn because anyone who's, you know, a fan in the SEC or uh, the Big Ten or the Big 12 and looks at Utah and says, well, they haven't been to the playoff yet, if that's your first reaction, I think it's not uh, an appropriate way to totally assess a football program when you consider they were in the Mountain West just over a decade ago. But it's also a legitimate thing to be able to say because they haven't gotten to the college football playoff yet. So I think that's the only thing that they're really missing right there. And if they become the first team since Washington to make it into the the top four at the end of the year, I think they'll be in a really great spot as as a football program. And, you know, obviously a, a chance to win a national championship would be great. But uh, there's no reason that they can't get into that top four. Yeah, I think... I- I want to stay on your comparison to like a a Baylor. I thought that was a really interesting comparison. I thought for me personally, I I tend to gravitate more maybe towards big 10 country with, with like Iowa and Wisconsin, because I think those are teams that, that really root their identity in the trenches. But that's where I think I'm seeing so much of the growth with this Utah team is that last year they, they had a lot of really good playmakers. They had an awesome quarterback who transferred from Texas, mind you, in cam rising. Um, but they, they feel like they're, they're not becoming just known for their defense or for their defensive line. I mean, you could make the argument. I think there's a legitimate argument to be made that the offense was better than the defense last year. And who, who knows the last time that that maybe was the case in, in Salt Lake City. But I feel like they're definitely gaining that respect. And to, to kind of compare them to Oregon, because I feel like this is something that I've been thinking about lately, like, for Oregon and Oregon fans, I think like a Pac-12 title and a Rose Bowl isn't enough. Like the next step for them is to get back to the playoff because they've, you know, achieved so much great success in these past couple of years. They recruited at a high level. But with Utah, I feel like that's a realistic step for them, but it's not necessarily the expectation like I think it should be with Oregon. I'm not sure I'm confident enough to say that right now with Oregon's roster, but just in terms of what they've been able to do. I think the expectation for Utah should absolutely be Pac-12 champion, you know, Rose Bowl champion. Um, but it's kind of interesting that, that you mentioned that about, you know, the playoff conversation, because I think it, it lends itself to how quickly they've, they've really made this jump since joining the Pac-12 more specifically, you know, in the past three to four years. Yeah, and and when you look at you know where they're kind of at in their ascension, you look at you know what other schools do, and the reason you know a lot of people kind of poo poo bowl season nowadays. I am just not one of those people, Max. I love bowl season. I I think it matters tremendously in, in a number of ways, and especially for a school that that's trying to you know sell itself sell itself as being on the upswing right you know trying to get uh, feelings of positivity you go out win a big non-conference game you got a couple million people watching you get some money for your program as well like there are still a, a lot of elements to that and you know thinking back to when when the ducks rose to prominence with with chip kelly like what did they do first right what was sort of the big goal that the the duck fans had back then it was to win a rose bowl and yeah they went you know lose a rose bowl then lose a national championship but then you win you, you win the rose bowl and it does feel really really good right when you want something for that long and then you're finally able to achieve it it does feel really really good and i think it does help legitimize your program but I think in the day and age where, you know, I'm certainly in the minority, I would say, of people who care a lot about college football bowl season and pay a lot of attention to it. I think now you, you probably get more attention on on preseason non-conference games and understandably so because of the, the playoff implications you can have there. But, you know, nowadays, maybe just getting to that that Rose Bowl game and, and putting on a show for the entire country the way that Ohio State and and Utah did was enough in the eyes of many to legitimize the Utes going up against a guy in C.J. Stroud, who might be a number one overall pick in the NFL draft and a number one receiver in Jackson Smith and Jigba, who went crazy. And Utah's secondary, of course, was. Yeah, I mean, he was just. Well, and that's one of the probably the best individual wide receiver performance I've ever seen in a game. Now, granted, Utah's secondary was beat up for for that game. They were they not have a running back team. playing corner. Yeah, they, they had they had yeah they, they had some guys playing corner who let's just say they would not be number one on the depth chart uh, right now, nor were they at the time. So uh, I think that that played into it. But still, uh, 
you, you can't you can't deny that uh, that Smith and Jigba was running really good routes and is a ridiculous playmaker. And Stroud was dropping dimes all over the place. But but Utah was going punch for punch with them. And it was, you know, just one of those games that didn't happen to bounce the Utes way. And I mean, they, they should, you know, Bryson Barnes went in there and, and led that drive down the field. I think he showed some real moxie there. And, you know, that, that that's a culture thing. When you can have a backup quarterback come in on that stage, when your starter goes down, you lead your team down the field. I mean, I, I think there there is an argument to, to talk about in the context of that game. You know, if Cam Rising stays healthy, what happens? Well, if Cam Rising didn't stay healthy and then Utah was able to go down the field and score. So, you can't look into it, you know, uh, too much, but still there, there's a, a cultural factor there when you lose kind of your, the, the leader of your team. But I, I think they just showed so much and uh, it did a lot of great things for their program. And sure, you would have loved to have gotten the win, but I, I don't think you can undersell the importance of, you know, just playing in that game and playing that well on, on such a big stage. Really quick tangent, but Tell me that moxie isn't one of the most underrated words. Oh my in, gosh! Like sports, bro. Like I, I know what you're talking about, but like when you said it, I kind of just had to look it up. So I'm just gonna <laughs> get our viewers and listeners up to speed. Moxie, spelled M-O-X-I-E, is a noun, and the definition is force of character, determination, or nerve. And the example sentence is: When you've got moxie, you need the clothes to match. So I feel like part of it kind of just comes with that swagger as well. Uh, It talks about force of character and determination. But yeah, I think that that's, you know, that's, it's a very fitting term for for Utah because the next point that I had here on uh, our show notes was give Kyle Whittingham his respect. I don't think that people are like actively like underplaying him, but like this is just another example I think of, because there were rumors of his retirement, I think, as the season kind of wound down. But for, for me on the outside, I'm kind of thinking like, dude, you can't step away now. Like you guys are just about to kick this into high gear. He's been a team. He's been a guy that I feel like, you know, you have the term OKG, our kind of guy. I feel like he, to a, to a degree, embodies that because Utah gets their kind of guy. And they've been known for the longest time as a program that develops and not necessarily the recruits at a super high level, but that's like another point that I want to get into here is kind of how they're recruit, how they're evolving and recruiting. But with the PAC 12, and this kind of goes back to how Utah is viewed. Kyle Whittingham has to be one of the top coaches in the conference. Now obviously Lincoln Riley has a super proven track record of of success. Uh, But after those two, I kind of wonder where you go because you have a lot of new faces with Kalen DeBoer going to Washington, Jed Fish, a newer face uh, at Arizona. Um, And then you have Carl Durrell at Colorado and David Shaw has been at Stanford forever, but they've been planning of course at Oregon. Yeah. And he's a first time head coach. So I feel like you kind of go Riley, uh, Whittingham. um, And and then I don't know my number three would maybe Jonathan Smith, just just because like Dan Lanning and a lot of these newer guys just aren't proven yet. Uh, Maybe, maybe Chip Kelly and then Jonathan Smith, but I really like what they're building in Corvallis. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think that requires a full, a full run through and evaluation full, like uh, deep dive to, to rank the coaches right now. Um, you definitely put Lincoln Riley at the top with, with his resume, even though he hasn't coached the game in the Pac-12. Does anybody think that USC is not going to be uh, a team that, that is to be reckoned with? <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, I think we can all see that. I mean, you have a guy who's been to the college football playoff multiple times, won at the Power 5 level, got conference championships. Like, that, that, that's not really much of much of a question mark. I, I think even though he's not what he was, you know, 12 years ago or so, Um, I I think you'd take Chip over Jonathan Smith right now. I I think Smith has done a a very, very admirable job with uh, with Oregon State. I mean, they bottomed out hard in 2017. It was was one of the worst football teams I've ever seen. That was just really, really brutal. And and he now had them at a point where they there was a very plausible scenario where they could have won the Pac-12 North in in 2021 and you know it's not going to matter as much going forward but for a program like oregon state it certainly does and so i I think that he's done uh, a really great job shaw has struggled the last couple years i don't anticipate him having such a bad year again i actually just recently on uh on on my show locked on pac 12 talking about uh you know all things conference of champions and whatnot 
I was going through their their schedule and predicting their their win total. And I think they're going to go six and six this year. And then I think bounce back again the following year, depending on what Tanner McKee does. If he leaves after this year, might make it tough. But I, I just think Stanford has uh, j- just kind of lost their way offensively. And I don't expect that to continue to be the case. And, it, you know, there's something to be said about when you hire a coordinator, sometimes he rides the wave of, the, the head coach who departed and then it, it sort of, you know, runs out from a momentum standpoint, you know, sometimes you have it like Ryan day at Ohio state. He, he clearly is doing just fine now that uh, now that urban Meyer is, is gone, but you know, Mark Helfrich at Oregon, for example, it didn't work out. It, it looked like the right hire immediately. It looked like in the immediate future, the right hire. And then you quickly saw once Mariota left and once Vernon Adams wasn't there, there was no, there, there was no long-term viability. And, and so Oregon ended up making the switch. Now they've been kind of on a run of new head coaches and such. But I don't think David Shaw has uh, has that label on him, and I don't think he should get it. You know, like, oh, it was just the Harbaugh momentum. His run of success has been too good for it to have just been the Jim Harbaugh momentum, right? Momentum from a previous head coach is a very real thing. And it can run out from a recruiting standpoint and a game plan standpoint and whatnot. And, you know, being a head coach it encompasses a lot of responsibilities. But I think that can last three years max. It's usually about two. And David Shaw has had his first two losing seasons in his last three campaigns. I just don't see that continuing once again. So I've got them at six and six this year. But, you know, I, I just it, it, it depends, you know, so I think you'd have to put him probably above chip right now just because chip had one good year and he needs to show that he can do it again after rebuilding ucla who you know hit a, a low point and whatnot and when he got there there wasn't a full assortment of scholarship players and it was just not a not not a great place to be and so i, I i'd put shaw above him and then probably chip and then jonathan smith and then everybody uh, i mean you can kind of throw Herm Edwards in there because he actually wins a decent number of games but that program is in complete disarray yeah, no, very good point. I, I'm, I, I, I am also in the camp of thinking that David Shaw can bounce back with Stanford. Um, I, don't, I don't think that that's a long term problem out there on the farm. But one more point I wanted to get into, Spencer, before we kind of take a closer look at both sides of the ball in Salt Lake, is how Utah is kind of pushing the envelope a little bit for them in terms of recruiting. Um, I mean, I'm not over here to say, wow, I mean, Utah signed an amazing class. They, they were ranked number 34 on the 247 rankings in 2022. But where I'm encouraged when I look at this class is the the push nationally for this class. Because Utah, to its credit, is an awesome state for for talent. I think it's it's very underrated. Um, you see programs from across the country that, that go to Utah for, for trench talent, particularly in the defensive line. Uh, as well as the offensive line um, with, you know, the Polynesian popu- population out there. But you're seeing guys in this 2022 class, just to, to rattle off a few, running back Jalen Glover out of Lakeland, Florida, linebacker Justin Medlock out of Manville, Texas, wide receiver Ryan Peppins from Alabaster, Alabama, and wide receiver Chris Reed from Apopka, Florida. So I feel like, you know, we know how talented, obviously, Florida is, Texas is, uh, Alabama and pretty much anywhere you look in the South uh, is, is super, super talented, but Utah isn't a team or a school rather that really has that much of a national brand. I mean, certainly not that of, of Oregon, you know, don't want to talk too much about Oregon, but obviously we can you know, relate because we both know that team and that school very well, but um, definitely not the likes of, you know, the, the Clemson, the Alabama's, the, the Ohio States, but that's gotta why you got to put USC in there with Lincoln. Definitely got it. Got it. Cause yeah, now that, now that Lincoln rally is taking over there, they're definitely recruiting nationally, not something they did super well under Clay Helton. Um, but that's why I feel like Kyle Whittingham can really, you know, kick this into high gear because you have a Pac-12 championship and a really competitive Rose Bowl game to, to help market yourself moving forward. And they've always been, a, a school under Woodyham that has developed really well. And I think had some pretty good success in the NFL. So I feel like that's another reason why I'm confident in, in Utah moving forward. 
Yeah, and, and there's a couple points that that I want to touch on there. First of all, that that Whittingham and and player mm-hmm. development go together like peanut butter and jelly, right? They just they, they mix. You, you you've had to do that over the years at Utah, doing a little bit more with a, a little bit less. And I think Utah is becoming less and less uh, of that sort of program in, in the Pac-12 and nationally they're still going to have to do it more than an Oregon or USC, or I think even a Washington is capable of recruiting at a higher level than, than Utah. You look at the top classes that the Huskies had when Chris Peterson was there and they got to the college football playoff, that team and, and that program is capable of being a top 20 uh, recruiting ranking team. Like, like that is what Washington is certainly capable of. They're actually in the top 20 for the 2023 class right now, they got a quarterback commit earlier today as we record this. And they've had just a, a bunch of, they've had 10 verbal commitments in the month of June. It's been a really good recruiting month for Kalen DeBoer. He's done a, a really nice job so far. Got a bunch of three stars and uh, some headline four star uh, prospects as well. But I think the other thing with Utah is that they're going to become less and less of a program that has to, you know, in a huge way, do more with less. For two reasons. Number one, games like the Rose Bowl and and this opportunity that they're going to have going down to Gainesville and playing Florida in the swamp in week one. Those are opportunities to put your program on the map, make people take notice and start to, you know, legitimize the the brand of Utah football in the eyes uh, of players. But do I ever think they'll be able to be at, at a level where USC and Oregon can get to from a recruiting standpoint? No. But the other thing that they do have going for them, at least that I've observed over the years, is Utah has always been a solid source of high school football talent. But I, I think it's one of the, the three states that the Pac-12 you know, recruits out of pretty heavily, Washington and Arizona being the other ones, that are starting to become more and more prominent on the recruiting trail. I think Arizona has the, the biggest history there, but the opportunity is certainly there for Washington because they're, you know, that they've got a growing population. And I just feel like more big time recruits are coming out of that state than, uh, than have done so in, in, in past years. I mean, you go back a ways, how many four and five star guys were coming out of the state of Washington in like, uh, 2010, 2011. I, I feel like it's not as many as there are right now. I mean, you have a guy like Caleb Presley, who's considering PAC 12 schools, a four-star corner. You got Jaden Wayne, highly rated four-star defensive end. Uh, Josh Connerly is a, a five-star offensive lineman going to Oregon. They've had a nut. There's a bunch of other names who have left the state over the years. That's something Kalen DeBoer has to be able to tackle as a coach is trying to keep the in-state talent there. But, that, that's something that, that Utah has going for it that, say, uh, a Colorado does not. There's not as much talent in the state of uh, Colorado, or even a Washington state does not. Even though there's more talent in that state, Pullman is as hard a place to recruit as there is in the entire country. But Utah and Salt Lake City, Salt Lake City is beautiful. I live a few hours south of it. It is a wonderful, wonderful place. And w- when you have some talent there as well, I think that recruiting will get a little bit easier, but there will still always be more players on, on Utah's roster that, you know, you-, you feel like Kyle Whittingham and that staff are maximizing to the fullest than, than are on, say, an Oregon or a USC or, or even a Washington if they can keep recruiting at a high level. All right, let's uh, let's switch things up a little bit and, and take a closer look at both sides of the ball here, Spencer. I think it'd be pretty interesting to just start with the offense, seeing that it was so effective last year. Um, I think the, the, uh, the conversation has to start uh, with, with Cam Rising, who was the – I think one of the top quarterbacks in, in the Pac-12 last year. First team all Pac-12. Yeah. So he he just he you know came in and, and just let it rip. I'm looking at some of his stats right now. Uh in 13 games, he he threw for 2,493 yards and 20 touchdowns against five interceptions and had about a 63% completion percentage. So I think that's one of the reasons that you got to be really confident about where the youth stand heading into next year, because you have a guy that comes to Utah and I don't think could have done much better, you know, in, in his first year, um, you know, as the the starter um, for the Utes, uh, I thought it was just super impressive how he was doing. And, and they're also just doing a really good job running the ball. Um, you have Tavion Thomas and Micah Bernard coming back, TJ Pledger, uh, is you know one of those backs that that you lose from a season to go, but Tavion Thomas just went absolutely crazy in the Pac-12 championship game. 
Um, and in that first game against Oregon, it was one of the two, but I know that he was definitely hearing his name called a lot uh, in, in that game. And then you, you do lose Britton Covey finally. Uh, that dude was just <laughs> in college for uh, about 10 years, but he was a tremendous wide receiver and specialist talent for Kyle Whittingham. And then you return both of your tight ends and uh, Brent Keithy and Dalton Kincaid. So a lot of pieces to, to still work with here for the use on offense next season. Yeah. And, you know, just to be clear, Britton Covey wasn't actually in college for 10 years. He was there for 12. But <laughs> I, I think that, you know, when you look at college football on a year by year basis, you're always going to have some amount of roster turnover, right? No matter how good or bad your team is, you're going to lose players. Nowadays, you'll lose a few more to the transfer portal sometimes, but you're never going to bring back everybody, right? Even in uh, college basketball, like that's, increasingly rare but when you look at the the total amount of talent that utah is is bringing back it's about as close as you can get to to having a fully you know a reloaded squad from what was a very successful offensive unit a season ago and yeah covey is a massive loss and i think cam rising is going to have to figure out who his top target's going to be because every time you had third and any anything from third and four to about third and eight you were just looking at the field, watching Utah football, going, "All right, where's number 18, and how is he going to get the ball?" And that that has, you know, uh, an effect on a quarterback in a good way, where he's, you know, knows where he wants to go with the ball, can draw the defense's attention as well. But now that that's not there, he's got to develop that chemistry with with somebody else, or you know, maybe he just spreads the ball around a, a lot. But quarterbacks tend to want to have, especially in college a guy that they can rely on in, in critical situations who's a big-time playmaker. So I'll be interested to see who that is. It could certainly be one of the tight ends. Utah has not been shy over the years about utilizing their tight ends in in the running game, certainly, but in the passing game as well. I, I think that both of those guys are, are two of the best pass catchers of the tight end position that we've got in the conference. Oregon's got some good ones. Luke Musgrave at Oregon State. Um, I, I saw something recently. Might have been, I think it was Athlon Sports. They put together their preseason all pack 12 teams. They went first all the way down to fourth team. And Musgrave was the fourth team tight end. And I was just like, no, <laughs> no, no, no way. Like, I'm not saying the other guys aren't good, but Luke Musgrave is not the fourth best tight end in the pack 12. He might be first. Po possibly second you might have you might have it's it's pronounced keithy right brant keithy okay if he's first then musgrave is is certainly second in there i thought that was a a criminal underrating there but you know if you have cam rising tavion thomas back in, in the backfield i think much like dtr and zach charbonnet at ucla you're just going to hear a lot of those two on uh on saturdays you can hear the names called a lot because they're going to have the ball in their hands about as often as as you can because they're explosive playmakers they know what to do when they get the ball and you know there's there's just so much to like from both of them thomas is an nfl caliber running back in, in my view and cam rising i don't know if he projects as a, a major quarterback at the next level i could see a team taking a late round flyer on him he could uh potentially be a backup but uh, certainly right now he's uh in, in my view the second best quarterback in the conference this year behind caleb williams yeah, just to put some some context to just how great the Utah offense was last year, led the Pac-12 in total offense with uh, 6,034 yards of total offense. So that actually uh, divvied up very nicely between the run and the pass for a very balanced offensive attack, just about 3,000 yards on the ground and through the air. And then when you're looking at yards per game, uh, you know, look at things. They were third in the conference with 431 yards per game. USC led the conference with 443.9 yards of offense a game. So I feel like we, we've talked about some of the great returning pieces that they have. And obviously you just have the, the benefit, the added benefit of consistency and, and continuity, um, not only with, with Cam rising, but, but also with the, the coaching staff and some of the, the guys that they have there uh, with Andy Ludwig, uh, as the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. So I feel like there, there's definitely, um, I think we're going to see another strong year of offense in, in Salt Lake. Um, I, we did have some more stuff that we wanted to get to with, with defense and the schedule prediction, but just kind of wanted to see if you had any other final notes on the offensive side of the ball. 
I think it's a huge stabilizer from kind of an emotional standpoint for an offense when you cannot just have your your reigning first team all Pac-12 quarterback returning to the team, but the running back as well. J- just having that presence there, I think, instills a lot of confidence in guys who are going to have to step up after the departure of a guy like Britton Covey or a couple guys they lost on the offensive line. I think that stability is really huge because you don't have any questions about about leadership, about who's going to, you know, uh, be a, a semi coach on the field, or you don't have any question about, you know, what sort of production to get or what to expect from Cam Rising and Tavion Thomas. You, you know exactly what it's going to be. And it, it could be even better than last year because you got to remember that those are young guys too. And they're watching film off season. They're working with coaches and they're getting in the weight room to, you know, figure out what ways they can improve their games respectively. So I, I think that's a big thing for the Utes. And, and I know that Kyle Whittingham and that staff are, are pleased to have them both back in the backfield this year. Switching over now to the defensive side of the ball for the Utes. They did lose a lot of production there from a season ago. Most notably, we have linebacker Devin Lloyd, who was the leading tackler on that defense and was the number two guy uh, in sacks. And then you had linebacker Nephi Sewell, who was the number two on the team in tackles. And then also your sack leader, linebacker Micah Tafua. Those guys are all gone from the last year's defense. So you figure those are, are pretty you know, central figures in, in that defensive front, that front seven. You also lose defensive lineman Xavier Carlton, who transfers within the conference to the California Golden Bears. But I think Morgan Scaley, just, he's, he's definitely one of the best defensive coordinators in, in the Pac-12. And, and this has really been the side of the ball that the Utes have hung their hat on uh, since Kyle Whittingham got to Salt Lake as the head coach. And then another guy that I think probably doesn't get enough talk in the conference has to be cornerback Clark Phillips. I think he's just a, a playmaker. I remember he had so much hype coming out of Southern California as a recruit, was initially committed to Ohio State, but here come the Utes late in the recruiting cycle, and they're able to flip him from the Buckeyes, and he's been – I feel like just phenomenal since, since he's gotten to the college level. Uh, he did lead the team last year in interceptions. So for a conference that I think is viewed as relatively pass heavy, um, it's, it's awesome to have a guy like Phillips who can lead your secondary. And um, especially with some of those guys that are losing, you want to have an experienced guy in the back end like that. Yeah, you want you want to have an anchor, like I was saying on the offensive side of the ball, a guy whose production the the coaching staff and the fans can count on, and you know you don't have to worry about it, right? And that's something that that can be really tough to find in the secondary or at any position group on the field, frankly, where you can just look at a player or a couple of players and go, okay, I I know what we're getting there. Don't have to worry about it whatsoever. That that's a a nice thing. That's a luxury to be able to have as a coaching staff and uh, as a football team. And I think they've definitely got that with Phillips in the secondary losing Devin Lloyd, even though I really like the transfer of Muhammad Diabate from Florida. I think he's a guy who figures to, to step in and start right away. They also added uh, another linebacker, Gabe Reed from Stanford, and then their highest rated recruit in the class of 2022, Landon Barton is a linebacker as well. So they should be fine at, at that position, but it will be a step back, e- even though I think they've done a nice job reloading there. You know, Reed was a four star recruit coming out of high school. I, I just don't think you can replicate Nephi Sewell and, and Devin Lloyd and specifically Lloyd, whose speed and tenacity and instincts just absolutely unmatched there are not that many first round linebackers in the country Nephi's brother Noah at Oregon is uh is certainly going to be one of them but th- that's about it that you lose those sorts of guys even if you replace them with talented recruits there's going to be some form of, of a drop off there so I think that that's where Utah might struggle like just a little bit I don't think it'll be a huge struggle but it will it be as productive of a unit as it was in 2021, I think the answer we can pretty confidently say is going to be a no. It doesn't mean they can't be good, but I think last year they were great. And I think expecting that is a little bit misguided, misguided, but Xavier Carlton, the guy who was supposed to pop more than he did. 
and, and Cal now is certainly going to hope that they're able to maximize him. But I, I'm shocked that that didn't work out better. He was a top 200 recruit when he came out in, in 2020, and he just never he, he was never able to reach his full potential there. Which, if he was at a place like say uh, a USC or a Washington State before Dickert got there, or UCLA with Chip Kelly where you've got offensive-minded coaches and offensive-heavy teams, you could maybe understand that. But you put together a guy with uh, – you put together a guy with the, those sorts of physical traits and that sort of recruiting caliber and a defensive staff like Kyle Whittingham's, I, I don't know why that didn't work. I, I, I really don't. There, there's sometimes not a great explanation for it. And yes, it's a loss, but it's more, you know, I think a, a realization of what Utah fans have seen in the last couple of years, which is th this guy is not popping the way that we thought. And, you know, he goes to another great defensive minded staff in Cal with Justin Wilcox, who, you know, a, a, as a head coach has been, I think, just OK so far. But as a defensive coordinator, I think he's one of the best may, maybe in the country. I think he's a really, really sharp defensive mind. It's the offense that's just lagged way, way behind for Cal and. You know, I, I think that's a good spot for him to be because you have a great defensive staff and you got some other good defensive players there. They might have the best defensive lineman in the Pac-12 coming into this year. So I, I, I think that that's just one of those things that doesn't always make a ton of sense because you think top 200 recruit, got the physical tools, going to a defensive head coach, a team that is known for defense year in and year out, and it didn't work. Like, that, I mean, that, that doesn't add up. That's two plus two equals five. Like the, the, the sum of the parts over here does not equal the sum of the parts over there. It needs to be an equal sign with a slash through it. But that's just uh, the way it goes sometimes. But overall, does it make me worried about Utah's defense? No, not at all. I mean, I also have eyes and, and can read statistics from over the years. And Utah has never had a bad defense. I don't think they're going to start now. And in fact, they've had a good defense basically every year. And I expect that to be the case again. I think it'll just be maybe just a, a half step back from what it was in 2021. The point you made about the the linebacker duo and the linebacker play with Lloyd and and Noah, it's not Noah, Nephi Sewell, uh, you know, departing is an interesting one because when I was doing research for the show, I was kind of surprised to see Gabe Reed's name because he was someone that I kind of forgot about a little bit. And there are so many guys that are moving within the PAC 12 and conferences across the country, but that was like a, definitely a, a bigger time linebacker um, name that, that I was aware of. So to, to I'm hope they're probably hoping that he can be a plug and play guy and kind of shore up some of that depth. And then recruiting wise, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's great that the top, player in their 2022 signing class is a linebacker uh, from Salt Lake City, no less, which is awesome. And then Van Fillinger is another guy on that defensive front, the defensive end that I'm going to have my eye on because he was a really highly touted guy coming out of high school, another in-state guy. So this is a school that obviously prioritizes in-state talent, like we've talked about, I think, a couple different times here. So those are a couple guys that I'm, I'm going to have my eye on to, to see where this Utah defense is. And I'm right there with you. I don't think there's going to be a huge step off, but when you drop off, when you lose the the star power that they did with, with Lloyd and Sewell and some other guys, it, it makes sense to see some, some of a drop off because that was one of the best seasons that they've had in, in a bit. Um, I know we're right around 40 minutes right now, Spencer, which is what I gave you when we, when we were almost going to record. So oh, we're how, good. We're how good. Are we doing I got time. time. I got time. I got time. Let's roll. Let's keep rolling. All right, well, I want to shift into, you know, the main event, if you will, of the show with the schedule prediction. We're going to go game by game here to wrap up the show, and we're going to see what our record prediction is for the Utah Utes in 2022. Starting off with a big, big game, the Utes head out to Gainesville to the Swamp to play the Florida Gators and first year head coach Billy Napier who comes over from Louisiana Lafayette and man this has to be one of the big headliner games that I think probably isn't getting uh, enough attention uh, you know nationally um, maybe because Utah they see them as a Pac-12 team and they're like oh whatever the Pac-12 sucks so like why are we gonna why are we gonna hype up this game but that's that's the defending Pac-12 champions against a you know very respected brand uh, in, in the SEC 
albeit the Gators are coming off a six and seven season. I think there's a lot of interesting storylines here, but it would really speak volumes, I think, to just the progression of the Utes if they're able to beat Florida, albeit that I'm, you know, pretty readily admitting that Florida isn't a top, top tier SEC program, but they definitely have uh, a pretty extensive history. And um, and I, and I kind of think that Napier is, is doing all that he can to, to kind of turn things around and, and, and have this team headed in the right direction uh, going into next season. Um, the, the quarterback picture is a little bit interesting when it comes to the situation in Gainesville. I think Anthony Richardson uh, has to be viewed or is viewed as the, the presumptive favorite to win that job. But uh, overall, I'd say Florida is a team that's known for having a pretty talented roster top to bottom, especially when you're located in the Sunshine State. Um, but I I think that I think that Utah can get this one done, but I could see it being a battle. So I'm gonna go off top and say that I think Utah gets it done and gets the win. It's a tough one. It's it's a really tough one. And to be fair to all those uh, fans out there in the ether who you know would look at this game and say, "Oh, whatever, the Pac-12 sucks." The Pac-12 does kind of suck. Uh, like if we're being blunt, it's been pretty awful. Absolutely. I don't know how else you de- I don't know how else you describe a conference that hasn't won a bowl game in the last two years. Like. It, what, what 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 else can you say? So I think when you look at uh, this game, it's one where Utah, last I had checked, is actually favored on the road. So the, the betting markets are giving the Utes the respect that, that they deserve. And um, I, I disagree with you slightly. I think there is a, a good amount of hype building up to uh, that particular game. I think it's going to get the amount of attention that, that it deserves because, as you pointed out, Florida is – trying to build back up a little bit right they were six and seven a, a year ago after a six and six reg- regular season lost to ucf and i think it was the gasparilla bowl uh something like that and so that's a program that that is starting over they got a first year head coach and utah's head coach has been there for for 18 years only team that's had a head coach longer the same head coach longer than uh, utah is kirk ferentz over there at uh, iowa and i liked your comparison of iowa to utah by the way but I think when you when you look at this game, there are a lot of things that that make you want to pick Utah. And the only thing that that doesn't is that it's in Gainesville. If this were in Salt Lake City, I'd take Utah every day of the week, and it'd probably be Utah. Like I think last I saw, it was minus two and a half. But if it were in Salt Lake City, this game is probably an eight-ish point spread um, at, at least, I, I would imagine. But I, I think that you've got the better quarterback. Roster wise, I don't know Florida's roster through and through. Uh, I, I know what they did a season ago and that they, you know, started off all right, but then fell off as as the year really went on. And, you know, e- even though it's an SEC team that's down, they've still been recruiting at an SEC level. Now, Dan Mullen didn't love recruiting while, while he was there. I, I understand that. But still, I bet if you look at their roster, it's probably full of a lot of four and five star guys. Uh, probably more fours at, at Florida than fives, but I'm sure there's a, a small handful at least. So I'll take Utah to to win this game. You know, when I was looking at the schedule, I looked at this game and I looked at UCLA and I said, Utah is going to get one. And, and I think if Utah wins this game, I think they'll lose at UCLA, even though it's not a great home environment the Bruins have at the Rose Bowl because it's not right on campus, which is unfortunate for for the Bruins and definitely makes it a little bit tougher on your football program as a whole but I I just can't see him going on the road to beat both Florida and UCLA and then you've got Oregon in the mix later in the season as well but I I don't think Florida is quite ready to be at the level because the other thing you have to consider is yeah it's it's Utah and I think that's part of the reason the line is actually so low because if a Florida team off a six and seven season, when they lost to a non power five opponent in a bowl game, if they were playing Ohio state in Gainesville, what is that line? Ohio state minus eight, Ohio state minus 10. It's something like that. But we saw a season ago, Utah and Ohio state played basically even and Utah what was beat up in that game. Now, Ohio State was missing a couple of their top receivers, but that clearly doesn't matter when you're at Ohio State because you have Marvin Harrison Jr. as literally your number four receiver going into the game. So you're fine in that sense. So I think it is, uh, from a branding perspective, kind of shaded a little bit in, in that sense of Utah not getting all the respect they deserve because I think if this were Ohio State, it would be a, a much bigger line. So I, I like the Utes there. 
uh, to, to start strong. Cause I think that's going to be an emphasis for them as well. They started so poorly last year and then they ended so well. Quarterback change was a, a big part of that. Putting Cam rising in there that made all the difference in the world. Only game he lost as a starter was, uh, the Rose bowl. And then on the road against Oregon state as well. Um, I, I think Utah is just the more well-rounded team. And I think they're coming off a much better season. They're going to be feeling better as a program, whereas it's a different vibe in Gainesville. So I, I like Utah to go down and get this win. Yeah, and what a big game that would be. What a big win that would be for the Pac-12, even Huge. though, even though, like, we were both admitting here that, like, Florida didn't have an amazing season. Like, that's, at the end of the day, that's a Pac-12 win over an SEC team, which is something yep. that the Pac-12 desperately needs. Um, and I thought there was one more point that I was going to make, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, I was just going to say that I feel like this is a, a, a big – a tough game for Billy Napier to start his coaching tenure in Gainesville with um, just with, with Utah. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that even though Utah probably isn't getting the respect they deserve nationally, um, albeit it's kind of warranted with how bad the conference is. I think that Billy Napier, if I'm him and in, in, in my office and in, in Gainesville, that I'm definitely got that game circle without a doubt. Uh, let's, let's head over to week two when the Utes face the in-state uh southern utah is it what's their what's thunderbirds their baby the thunderbirds. thunderbirds so yeah for you guys that don't know spencer he, he does do some play-by-play -play for the thunderbirds uh i'll let you start with uh this prediction well i i don't want to be too bold here but um i think utah is going to win this game by about 50 um, I, I think that that might be uh, underselling it. This is a Southern Utah program that is uh, not at the Big Sky Championship level that it has reached within uh, the last decade. It is transitioning into the WAC, the Western Athletic Conference, the uh, one-time home of Boise State back in the day, but it has gone from uh, it has gone down to being at the FCS level after previously being FBS back. They were FBS football went away. They came back. Now it's uh, FCS. Um, so this is not just an FCS opponent that Utah is facing. This is an FCS opponent that is tearing it all the way down to the roots and rebuilding. And they do not have a roster that is going to allow them to pull an upset the way Montana did at Washington a year ago or NAU against Arizona or anything like that. So this this will be uh, this will be an easy one, and um, you know I, I don't think they're going to lose to San Diego State two years in a row either. Okay, yeah. So don't want to don't want to spend too much time on on Southern Utah because I feel like this is kind of a gimme game. Um, yeah, it's it's that, it's, that, it's, it's, a, it's a gimme. Yeah, so we don't need to spend too much time on that. And then week three, the the Utes face San Diego State, who I mentioned last year defeated the Utes in triple overtime out in Southern California. Now San Diego State has to come to Salt Lake City to Rice Eccles Stadium, which has a pretty awesome environment just from what I've seen on Fantastic. TV. Fantastic. I definitely want to go out to a game there. But I'm kind of in the same boat as you where I think that, that I'm sure that they're upset about that loss last year and, and you know how it came down to the wire, how they want to start the season on a high note. But San Diego State is, is definitely no slouch when it comes to the non-conference slate. Uh, they went 12 and two last year in, in the Mountain West, uh, seven and, or sorry, overall seven and one in the Mountain West. And I think that they're definitely in that conversation year in and year out as, as one of the top teams in the Mountain West, which I think has, I'm not going to say it's an amazing conference, but Spencer, it has these teams that I think can kind of catch people if, if they don't stay on their guard. If you look at Utah State, if you look at Fresno State, I feel like every weekend last year i was looking at fresno state and jay caner was pulling out some amazing comeback or just crazy yep. performance i think about that ucla game where i think he lost about five ribs and I, every i think that was the game right when he was just super Dude's banged a gamer up. he's yeah just, he's he's just a gamer max he's just a gamer exactly so he's really fun to watch but uh you know i'm gonna i'm gonna go with uh, a win over san diego state to start the season three and oh yeah, I, I like that as well. And in fact, whatever the line is, give me Utah to cover. I, I, I think this is going to be, you're going to have a revenge game from a triple overtime loss at home. Yeah, get, give me the Utes all day there. You, you would be hard pressed to pick against Utah in any way, shape or form here. I, I think they're going to come out and, and really stick it to San Diego State, who 
as you said, is a good team. Mountain West got a number of respectable programs that that trip up Power Five schools on a regular basis, as Fresno State did last year. I don't know how Jerry Azanero wasn't fired after that game as uh, UCLA's defensive coordinator to allow what was it, 37 points to a non-Power Five opponent at home. That was um, that was pretty darn bad. Uh, but I, I think this is a game against San Diego State where I'll I'll, I'll take the Utes all day. I, I like them big. Okay, so um, uh, I'll say I'll say this. Hopefully, you're keeping. I know you have your predictions in our notes, but I'm gonna also keep a record, and then we can kind of compare our records at the end. But I think uh, I have them at three and zero. Do you also have them at three and zero? Because I know I you, you, yeah, you almost said they were going to lose to Florida because you were saying it was a toss up between that and the UCLA game. So we both yep. have them at three and zero. Now we get into game number four for the Utah Utes, which also mar- marks the beginning of Pac-12 play against the Arizona State Sun Devils on September twenty fourth. Last year, the Utes took care of business and got a win over the Sun Devils, thirty five to twenty one at their home stadium in Salt Lake, but now they have to go on the road to Tempe. And what's interesting, because we were talking about Florida in this episode, one of Florida's quarterbacks has made his way out west in Emory Jones, who comes to Tempe following the departure of Jaden Daniels to the boot to play for Brian Kelly and the LSU Tigers. But it it still does kind of feel like ASU is, is on very rocky ground right now. Um, After last season, they did go eight and five. Uh, I feel like whenever I was, you know, looking into them, I, I feel like I had I saw some pretty good linebacker play, um, and then I also saw some pretty good uh, running back play as well to kind of complement Jaden Daniels. Uh, but but they lose a couple of those backs. the The names are completely escaping me right now. Is it Rashad White is one of them? I think. Um, yeah. Well, he's one of the running backs they lost to the NFL. Yeah. He. So he. Yeah. Just from a season ago. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to think on the fly of some pieces that they may be lost. Obviously Daniels is the most notable one. Uh, They had, they had, they, they're at a bunch. There's too many, there's too many to go through. They lost Jermaine Lole to, uh, Louisville as well. Their top defensive lineman coming into, uh, 2021. I mean, there's, it was kind of a mass exodus because of the NCAA investigation. And it's just, it's, it's all a mess and they've revamped the coaching staff. They're, they're over unders down to five and a half. I think ASU goes under that this year. And I, I don't think this is a problem for Utah at all, I, I, even though they're on the road in Tempe. Crazy things have happened in uh, in in the desert before at, at both schools over the years. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to be one of them. I, I think the Utes take care of business right there. Okay. Yeah, I think – I mean – there has been so many departures, but I feel like Arizona State has kind of started to improve with recruiting. But with you know the ongoing NCAA investigation, that's obviously not a great thing to have on your plate as you uh, go into another season, which is even tougher because you have what I think is a very respectable coach in Herm Edwards. But if you have this going on under, under his watch, that's that's definitely a blemish. So both of us have the Utes at four and zero, and then the next week they uh, return to Utah to. Actually, do they have a – no, they don't have a bye. Um, I'm messing that up on the calendar. But the next game, they have the Oregon State Beavers, and this is an interesting one because, in my opinion, Spencer, I feel like Oregon State has to be viewed as number two in the Pac-12 North, if not number one you know, to Oregon. It's, it's kind of crazy. I feel like the top two teams in the Pac-12 North might both be in the state of Oregon. What do you? What's your read on this matchup? I, I agree with you that Oregon State is going to be right there again with Washington State as one of the top teams in the Pac-12 North of the two. I think the Cougars are more likely to take a step back than than the Beavers are. I, I think top to bottom, the roster is a little bit more uh, short up for, for Oregon State. The thing with this game, and, and this is sort of, uh, again, a quick prediction for me with Utah, I don't think I can pick them to lose at home. I, I just, I don't see it. And I know Oregon State beat them a season ago, but that was in Corvallis, where the Beavers were undefeated at home last year. But you've got Oregon State at home. USC, I think, is going to have the best chance. They will have had several weeks under their belt, uh, and that's two weeks after the Oregon State game, uh, you know, to to really get a feel for how their, how their team is going to operate under Lincoln Riley. That's the best chance Utah has to lose at home. But... 
you, you got Oregon, you know, Southern Utah, that's a gimme. San Diego State, I think they'll blow them out. I think Oregon State will be a win. USC, again, a win. And then their last two home opponents are Arizona and Stanford. And though I, you know, talked earlier on the show about how I, I believe the Cardinal will be improved this year, I don't think they're going to go on the road and win uh, against Utah. And so it's just hard for me to pick against the Utes with that home field advantage. They've sold out 70 straight games at, at Rice Eccles. And that, that's just, it, it's a tough thing to do in the world of college football to go on the road and win. And there are not a lot of places tougher to walk out of w- with a victory than, than Rice Eccles stadium. Uh, especially if you get it at nighttime under the lights, that's a, that's an electric environment out there. Uh, certainly one of the best and most underrated stadiums and, and environments in the country, the fans and students do a really good job. So um, I, I just, I, I can't pick against them at, at home this year. So I'll, I'll take them to beat the beeves here. Okay. And, and I think, one other note, I mean, it looks like uh, the Bees are going to be going with Chance Nolan as their guy uh, listed on the roster as a redshirt junior. So you have some continuity and, you know, some veteran experience there, although they did have Tristan Jevia who played, um, you know, a little, I think, on and off kind of throughout the year, if I'm remembering that correctly. But he I got hurt. He got he got hurt and Nolan took over. OK, yeah, that, that must have been what it was. OK, so we got that. And then. I think this is going to be a close game. I think that Utah gets it done. But if there's a team that can you know, give, give Utah a good shot. And I think someone who probably doesn't match up as well from a roster standpoint, but clearly they have Jonathan Smith has those guys bought in. And I mean, the culture is totally revamped. I think in Corvallis, I don't want to praise them too much, but I do feel like that's a team that has, uh, you know, some really good pieces in place and, and is headed in the right direction. But uh, the next week uh, on the Utah schedule, they face the UCLA Bruins. Um, which it, it, this was one of the more interesting headlines. I feel like recently with, with PAC 12, I don't know what time frame we're looking at, but I think it was after last season, the Bruins extended chip Kelly and it felt yep. like it was kind of a prove it year um, for, for chip Kelly in Westwood. I think that was his fifth season or fourth or fifth season. He's been there for a minute now. So he's pretty, he's pretty entrenched there. And, a lot of people were really hyped about UCLA last year, right? They had that early season win over LSU. LSU didn't end up being too great of a team last year. So I think that maybe people were making more of that than they should have. But like I said, with the Utah Florida matchup, that's still a patchable win over an SEC school. So it that's was, definitely, it was a good, it was a good win. It's a good, it was win. a good win. Yeah. That's that. I mean, that that's kind of what I'm trying to, to get at here, but UCLA definitely not known for having a super intimidating home environment, but this is a really experienced team on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, and they return their guy at the most important position at quarterback with Dorian Thompson Robinson. They also have Zach Charbonnet as one of the best backs in the pack 12. You do lose Kyle Phillips, who is an electric wide receiver. I believe that Greg Dulcich is also, uh, yep, Dulcich to the he's NFL. Not there, he's not there anymore. Um, Chase Coda is now in Eugene, although he wasn't crazy effective, uh, in, in Westwood, but, I feel like this is definitely a game that I could see Utah getting tripped up on a bit because it is a way and they're going to be going against a team that looks like it's also kind of hitting their stride. Um, again, a game that I think could kind of be a toss up. I can see it being really competitive, but I think that Dorian Thompson Robinson and the, the Bruins are uh, a team that's kind of positioned to challenge UCL or sorry, Utah in the PAC 12 South, obviously USC is in that conversation, but if we're just talking about what have you done for me lately, UCLA, I think, inspires more confidence just based off of last year's body of work. Yeah, and I, I, I should let you know, Max. I got about like eight minutes here uh, okay. before before let's, I got. Let's fire I got, it off. I got to roll out, so we'll we'll fire through the 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 last few here. Um, so I think this will be Utah's first loss. I, I I think that this is the year that UCLA finally gets the better of Utah. Uh, Kyle Whittingham has had Chip Kelly's numbers so far, but. Even though you lost those offensive weapons, I think this is probably going to be Chip's best team. They've also added some defensive transfers. They got a new defensive coordinator, which they badly needed. I think that's going to make a difference in this game. But you talk about a great quarterback matchup in the Pac-12. Cam Rising against Dorian Thompson, Robinson, a couple of, of experienced guys. Nobody more so in this conference than than DTR, of course. And uh, I think you know two very different ways of playing the position, but both effective in, in their own right. And 
I think this is going to be a, a good season for UCLA. I have high hopes for them. I'm pretty high on them as a team. I like what they've done in the transfer portal. They have the number five, or at least last time I looked, number five uh, transfer portal class in the country. And a lot of that is coming on the defensive side of the ball. But Jake Bobo, a name to watch, the Duke wide receiver transfer on the offensive side. We'll see if they can uh, find a tight end who can replicate what Greg Dulcich has done. But Chips had success with uh, with tight ends during his time in Los Angeles with the Bruins. But, you know, Zach Charbonnet is, is a workhorse running back. You know they're going to be able to run the ball with DTR back there. Um, but the, the name to watch out for this year for UCLA offensively is Kazmir Allen. He goes by Kaz. Uh, so you'll hear him called Kaz Allen, and that's a guy who has got big time explosive speed. And he is a solid wide receiver who needs to take a leap in his production to fill the void left by Kyle Phillips and uh, to a lesser extent, Chase Cota. But I think Kaz Allen is somebody who, you know, is he, he's in the right offense. He is he's in Chip Kelly's system, and that is exactly the sort of player that that Chip wants to have. He's just a straight speedster. He can go over the top. You get him the ball in space. He's involved in the kick return game, jet sweeps, whatever. You get him the ball, he's going to make plays. And uh, I think that, you know, the offense is going to be more than enough for them to to be able to get this win. And, you know, I it's you can't come on here and predict the team going undefeated because in a power five conference, it just doesn't happen very often. So losses have to come somewhere. Um, and I think UCLA is going to be the the first of, of two in the regular season for Utah. All right, and then next week they have the USC Trojans, and they get that game at home in Utah. I mean, this is gonna have a game. This is gonna be a game that has a crazy, crazy billing. Obviously, Lincoln Riley in his first year. Um, you know, this this could be the two top teams in the Pac-12 South. I I understand the hype behind USC, but I'm not gonna buy into it until I see the product on the field. I think it's, a game like this is gonna come down to the trenches. That's kind of an easy point to make just with the football. Like you know, you gotta win in the trenches, but. USC in particular is a team that I don't think has has been where it needs to be in the trenches in recent years. Um, offensive or defensive lines, I think Corey Foreman's obviously a huge piece of that defensive line that they need to step up. USC loses Drake Jackson, who's now playing for my 49ers. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and give this one to Utah again at home. I, I just don't know if, if Lincoln Riley can turn this around that quickly to, to get a win like this over Utah. I'm going Utes against USC. Yeah, at home, I like I said, I, I can't pick against the Utes. I think that crowd is uh, is too big time, and it's just asking too much for USC to go from four and eight, even with all the transfers, to beating the reigning Pac-12 champions and incoming favorites on the road. Um, so I'll, I'll take the Utes here. I, I think it's a good game, a competitive game, but I think Utah is going to be able to, with the better defense in that game, ultimately get it done. All right, we're rolling right along. Washington State is the next game for the Utes, and they're a team that they just had so so much change over this offseason. They've lost a lot, lost a lot of big pieces. Abraham Lucas is a big guy on that offensive line. Jane Delora stays in the conference, goes to Arizona. He was kind of the face of that offense alongside Max Borgie and uh, Dion McIntosh. So I feel like all the pieces that they lost, I'm really confident in Jake Dickert just as a coach but not a great situation for them, especially with this game against Utah. I'm going Utes over Washington State. So I think Utah is going to win their final four games of the year. But as I said, I've got them 10-2 and two in the regular season. But they've got two home games after Washington State, Arizona and Stanford. They've got better rosters. They're better teams. Those are going to be wins. I do think they'll beat Oregon again, even at Autzen Stadium, which is a very tough place to win. Of course, I, I believe they're going to to win against Colorado, even though that game is in Boulder. But I don't think that you can go from a double trouncing to suddenly getting a win. I, I think the game will be more competitive, but Utah is clearly a better football team, so I'll take them to win that. But their second loss of the regular season, Max, I, I've got it in that week at Washington State. I, I think that there's all it, it feels like every year there's a team that that stumbles or comes very close to stumbling in a major way up in Pullman. And, and I know that, you know, anybody watching or listening to this right now might say like, oh, yeah, Utah's got the better roster than Washington State. They're the better team. Yeah, they, they are. But that's why they call it an upset. And they happen every single year. Last year, you would have been uh, crazy if you'd gone on and said uh, San Diego State is going to hang with Utah and they're going to, you know, uh, beat them. And that's 
something that actually happened. And I, I think the upset and same thing with uh, with Oregon State and Utah, right? Utah was rolling. They, they were, you know, playing Cam Rising and quarterback. They'd made the switch and everything was going great. And then they went up to Corvallis and they lost. And, you know, though I think this Washington State team could be an eight win program, I could also see them falling back and winning five or six, but they're going to be tough uh, nevertheless. And I, I just feel like that's one of those games that that is ripe for for a Pac-12 upset. And I think that's where I think that's where Utah falls right there is is at Washington State. Um, but then they, they close with, uh, I think, four straight strong wins down the stretch, three of which will be pretty easy. Oregon, obviously, a, a little bit less so. But I don't know how you can look at the two teams after last year and say that, that Utah's not the, the better team overall. And though they're better overall than Washington State, you can't win every game. And that's just the one that I think they're going to drop. OK, no. Yeah, I think we got a little bit of disagreement there, but that's definitely healthy for for a podcast like this. Um, I, I think that they're still going to be able to pull it out over Wazoo, but they definitely Wazoo's had that upset factor to them. I think, you know, just the, for the longest time that yep. they're, you know, a, a team that can kind of get you if you're not on your a game. Um, but just to rattle it through real quick, I know you got to get out of here, Spencer. Yeah. I'm going to yep. go win over Arizona. That team was just an embarrassment last year. Credit to Jeff fish though. He's like overhauled almost a third. They're I think, growing. Of that roster. They're, 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 they're growing, but they're two years away from being legitimately competitive. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're on the same page there as far as a win over Arizona, uh, Stanford, uh, definitely another one of those teams I think has a history of being gritty and competitive. I think that game, I could see it coming down to Tanner McGee, uh, McKee and how he's uh, able to be effective, uh, against the Utah defense. I'm going to push back a little bit and say, I think Oregon wins that game over Utah. Um, I think that having Bo Nix rather than Anthony Brown just could be a game changer. Um, they, they were just very limited last year with, with their downfield passing attack. And I think that Kenny Dillingham revamping the offense and, and just making them a little bit more aggressive and, and versatile could definitely be that, that refresher that they need. And I don't think, I think Oregon gets back on track against them after two absolutely embarrassing losses from a season ago. And then I have them winning, uh, against Colorado because, well, Colorado is just not very good. That'll be uh, an interesting. They're going to have a rough. Colorado's going to have preview. a rough season. It's going to be a rough year in bold. They were four and eight last year, and they lost a number of their best players. That's a bad place to be. Yeah, it's it's not going to be great. So I think, uh, I think we actually have the same records, but just losses coming in in, ver- in different spots a little bit. Um, yep, I've got ten. And, I've got ten and two. Yeah, I got 10 and 2 also. I think the only difference that we have is that that Oregon win. I'm saying Oregon wins. You're saying that Utah wins. And then I'm saying Washington State loses. I'm saying Utah yeah. beats Washington State, but you have them upsetting the Utes. Uh, but before we get out of here, sorry, it's kind of an abrupt ending, folks, but we wanted to try to hit on everything, and we just talked about a lot of great stuff. Spencer, where can people find more of you? Uh, at Smalls underscore 55 on Twitter or either of the shows I host are uh, Locked on Ducks and Locked on Pac-12. They're at LO underscore Pac-12 and at Locked on Ducks. DMs are wide open on there. You can find my shows on YouTube as well. Subscribe to the channels if you want to keep up to date with uh, the content that I'm shared on there. You, you can find this guy making an appearance every now and then uh, as well. But yeah, Max, good, good to come on with you, man. And I, I look forward to doing it again. Absolutely, man. Well, I was glad to have you on the show and uh, just talk some football. Kind of cool to do it about a team not named Oregon. If you guys want to find more of me, you can follow me on Twitter at mtourist sports and you can follow the Pac 12 Takeover podcast on Twitter as we get going at P12 Takeover. And then you can find us on YouTube, the Takeover Sports Network YouTube channel. We are closing in on a thousand subscribers, so it would be a huge help for us if you could like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, But that'll do it for us on this episode of the Pac-12 Takeover Podcast with the Utah Utes. I'm your host, Max Torres. That's Spencer McLaughlin, and we will see you guys next time. Take care.